I'm Tom McCann. I'm the president of the Friends of the Libraries, Boston University. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to ask everyone, as I do every time, to please check to be sure your cell phone or beeper or whatever you have is turned off. Okay, thank you. Tonight, we welcome a distinguished author and features editor of Opera News, Brian Kello. Mr. Kello began writing at uh, Oregon State University as a reporter and editor for student publications. In, um, in, 19, in, in 1982, he moved from Oregon to New York City and oversaw the publications at the 92nd Street uh, YMCA before joining the editorial staff of Opera News five years later. Currently, he's the magazine's features editor, and his popular column, On the Beat, appears in each month's issue. He's also written numerous profiles of many of the leading figures of the opera world. Brian Kello uh, has also contributed articles to other major publications, including Playbill, Newsday, and many, many others. He's the author of Can't Help Singing, The Life of Eileen Farrell, and The Bennetts, An Acting Family. His new book, Ethel Merman, A Life, was released in November to rave reviews. And um, as a matter of fact, there was a great review in the uh, last Sunday's uh, New York Times book review. Uh, he joins us tonight in the midst of his book tour. Uh, he's brought with him these clips of his current subject. Here we go. I know what you mean, uh, something up to date. We have it. Let's see. Uh, here it is. An American song, Irving Berlin, The International Rag. Hmm, 1913. Well, that's fairly up to date. Let's give it a whirl. Real razzmatazz, Highness. Razzmatazz. <laughs> Excuse me. You got 
got excited and you started something. Nations jumping all around. You got a lot to answer for. They lay the blame right at your door. The world is ragtime crazy from shore to shore. London dropped its dignity. So has France and Germany. All hands are dancing to a raggedy melody full of originality. The folks who live in sunny Spain dance to a strain that they call the Spanish tango. Dukes and lords and diplomats dressed in tails and opera hats throw up their shoulders to that raggedy melody full of originality. Italian opera singers have learned to snap of their fingers. The world goes round to the sound of the international rock. That was 1913. Still today, each European throws up his shoulders to that raggedy melody full of originality. All Harrys, Dicks, and Tommies, and someday even Tommies will dance around to the sound of a raggedy melody full of originality. Oh, oh, wiggle your personality. Doing the international, doing the international rock.
no, no, it's terrific, because you and me, we come from two different worlds. Y you know, that's true. I'm used to the bright lights of Broadway, and you're used to the bright lights of a police station. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I was really hoping, you know, that maybe you and me, we could do a song. But I soon realized that there was no way that you could do our music. Oh, yes, I can. Uh, no, Ethel, you can't. But as a matter of fact, Bowser, anything you can do, I can do better. <laughs> anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Anything you can be, I can be greater. Sooner or later, I'm greater than you. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I can shoot a partridge with a single cartridge. I can get a sparrow with a bow and arrow. I can live on bread and cheese. And only on that? Yeah. Looking a rat. I can sing anything higher than. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can. Yes, I can. No, you can. Yes, I can. No, you can. No, you can. Yes, I can. You know that commercial that uh, Ella Fitzgerald did where she sang so loud that she broke the wine glass? Yeah. Well, I sang so loud that I broke Ella Fitzgerald. <laughs> In my coat? In your vest? In my snakes? In your hat? No, you can't. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Anything you can dig, I can dig deeper. I can dig anything deeper than you. 30 feet. 40 feet. 50 feet. 60 feet. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Hold it. <laughs> Ethel, this is where I got you. I once dug a hole that was 10 feet deep and 100 yards long. Oh, I can't believe that. <laughs> Ask the warden. <laughs> Quicker and get even sicker. I can't open any safe. Without being caught? Yeah. That's what I thought, you crook. Anything you can sing, I can sing sweeter. I can sing anything sweeter than you. No, you can't. Oh, yes, I can. No, you can't. Oh, yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Can, can. Yes, I can. I'll try. Would you sing a, a Marvin Hamlish song? Marvin, I thought you'd never ask. With lyrics by Ed Kleban. <laughs> Kiss today, goodbye. The sweetness and the sorrow. Wish me luck, the same to you. But I can't regret what I did for love, what I did for love. Look, my eyes are dry. The gift was ours to borrow. It's as if we always knew. And I won't forget what I did for love, what I did for Point me 
tired tomorrow We did what we had to do Won't forget, can't regret What I did for was really great. Thank you so much for putting it together, Brian, and bringing it. And um, uh, Brian's papers are part of the Howie Gottlieb uh, Archive uh, Research Center, and we're very pleased to have him here this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Brian Kellogg. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, just a few notes on what you just saw. Um, uh, the, the first appearance uh, when she's wearing the yellow dress and singing Riding High is from The Ed Sullivan Show, and it took place just three weeks after her daughter had died. 
uh, quite suddenly, quite unexpectedly in 1967. And uh, the, in, in, for those of you who might not have been Sha Na Na fans, that was Bowser from the Sha Na Na show singing Anything You Can Do With Her. Uh, this was when she was branching out and trying to connect with younger audiences. So um, just a few notes. Um, I'm delighted to be here tonight. I have been coming to the Gottlieb Archival Research Center for a number of years, working on my various books, and I remember so well the first time I came here, Dr. Gottlieb was still here, and I was working on uh, research, I believe, for my Eileen Farrell book, and I was sitting in the, the research room with all the other people who were working on their various projects, and Dr. Gottlieb walked in, dressed immaculately, as he always was, with his rather ornate cane, and he walked in very authoritatively and said, where's Mr. Kello? And I sort of snapped to attention. I, it was like the headmaster in school or something had just asked me to come up to the front of the class. And he was so warm and welcoming. And uh, that is the experience that I have always had here in, in all the subsequent books I've done. And uh, Vita Palladino and Sean Noel are just two of my favorites. They're just wonderful, wonderful people. And I'm so glad that uh, the wonderful work is being carried on under Vita's stewardship. So I wanted to thank them, first of all, very much for asking me to be here. Um, I hope it's all right with you uh, if I do it this way. I thought I'd tell you just a little bit about my own background and how I came to be a journalist and ultimately a biographer. And then I would end by reading just a little passage from Ethel Merman, A Life, uh, my, my latest book, which just was published uh, about three weeks ago. And I am very happy to say it has gotten a tremendous reception. Uh, you always want it to be good and you always want it to be successful, but you never quite know what's going to happen to a book when it goes out into the world. But I'm, I'm happy to say this one seems to be landing very safely. So uh, I grew up on the Oregon coast, a long, long way from here, about as far as you could get and stay in the continental U.S. And it was a tiny little place. There was really not much around. Portland was 90 minutes away. Uh, but I didn't feel that I was culturally deprived in any way. I, I just didn't. Uh, there was a lot of music in our home. There were a lot of books in our home. I, I was blessed to have parents who regularly discussed current events and, and world issues, usually, <laughs> usually with a lot of venom. <laughs> but uh, uh, it was a lively household to grow up in. And it was a real privilege. Uh, my mother was a very musical person. She loved operetta. That was her idea of, of great music. She liked opera up, and, up, and, up to and including a point. But she really liked operetta and, and lots of different kinds of music. My father, very unmusical. His, his favorite song was Buttons and Bows by Dinah Shore, which I have to admit I, I like too a lot. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, <laughs> my mother absolutely hated Ethel Merman with a passion. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Ethel Merman would come on television on the Ed Sullivan show or the Merv Griffin show or whatever she happened to be appearing on that particular week, and she would say, please turn it off. I cannot stand the sound of that woman's voice. So uh, I, I've come to think that maybe my, my initial fascination with Ethel Merman started out as some kind of teenage rebellion or something. I don't know. But, um, but I fell in love with Ethel Merman right away. Anyway, I, uh, I attended Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon, and uh, while I was there, I worked on the campus newspaper, the arts and entertainment section of the Daily Barometer, which was the daily student paper. And I, I don't know, it's, it's interesting to me when I hear people talk about how they've, they've wanted to be lots of different things in their lives and they've made all these transitions from one to the other to the other. I just never remember ever wanting to be anything but a writer. I was just burning to write from the time I was a child, really. And so finally, at Oregon State, I got a chance to do it for, for a public. Uh, I was appearing uh, in the, the uh, Campus Arts Magazine montage every Friday. 
And I learned a lot, and I see uh, in the back here in this wonderful exhibit that the, the people at the Gottlieb Archival Research Center have put together that there's a, a copy of, of one of those <laughs> student magazines when I had sunglasses and a beard, which was a very, very long time ago. Um, so I graduated, and I did the kind of thing that you're only stupid enough to do when you're very, very young. I came to New York City with $400 and one navy blue blazer and a few other things. I think, I think everything I had fit in one suitcase. And I found work right away uh, at Harcourt Brace Jovanovich Publishers, which was then located on 3rd Avenue in New York City. I later went to work for Time Life, uh, the 92nd Street Y in its concert office, which gave me access to wonderful music of all kinds. And then in 1988, I got a job on the staff of Opera News Magazine. And the editor who had hired me was let go about six months after I arrived. So I immediately thought, well, that's the end of me. You know, whoever his successor is is probably going to bring in an entirely new staff. But that wasn't what happened. Uh, uh, his successor actually promoted me, and I have been happily at Opera News ever since. Uh, it has been a, a great job in the sense that I have gotten to write about so many of the leading singers, conductors, stage directors, designers in the opera world, and get to know many of them quite well. I've learned an immense amount in that time, and I'm still learning because the opera world is a very different place from what it was when I first started going. Um, I see my friend Allison Cohen is here in the audience, and Allison can remember uh, when I first moved to New York, and I was absolutely possessed by Joan Sutherland, right? <laughs> it, was, it was just, I, I, I ate, slept, and drank Joan Sutherland, but... Uh, all these years later, I'm, I have to say the, the world of opera and writing about it is, is still just as fascinating to me as it was back then. Uh, the first book that I wrote uh, was published in 1999, and it was called Can't Help Singing, and it was actually a collaboration with Eileen Farrell, the great opera and pop singer who appeared here in Boston a great deal, actually. Uh, and it came about in a funny way. I had been assigned by the editor-in-chief of Opera News to do uh, an article on Eileen because she had uh, come out with a series of, of pop recordings quite late in her career, and they're quite remarkable, most of them. And one of these albums had just been released, and I was assigned to go interview her at the Westbury Hotel in New York. And how many, I'm just curious, how many people here ever heard Eileen Farrell sing live? Oh, good for you. That's great. Uh, and uh, I'd heard all the stories about her that she was, you know, could be kind of a tough character, and she had quite a mouth, and, and she was uh, uh, a very funny woman, all of which turned to be out to be true. So I went to interview her. We had a great time, and she liked the article. She wrote me a note after it was published, and I ran into her at the Algonquin Hotel about, oh, I don't know, three years later, maybe. And we were sitting talking, and I said, has anyone ever asked you about writing your autobiography? And she said, oh, oh yeah, all the time. And I said, well, what do you think? Would you like to do it? She said, well, I'll tell you, no. I've, no, I've always said no, because uh, there are only two things that you talk about in a singer's autobiography. One is how great you were, and you quote your own reviews, and I'm not interested in doing that. And the other is who you slept with. And she said, and maybe I did, and maybe I didn't, but at this point, I'm not telling. <laughs> so I said, well, I think maybe there's a different, we can, there's a third way <laughs> that we can do this. Uh, and so I talked her into it, and starting in, early 1997, we met every Saturday at her apartment in New Jersey. And I have to say, I don't think I ever had so much fun in my entire life. There were, there were Saturdays when we just sat and laughed until we couldn't stand it. Uh, she was one of the funniest people I have ever known in my entire life. 
And it was a unique career uh, that Eileen was, was someone who could really sing anything. She could sing Wagner. She could sing Strauss. She could sing Verdi and Puccini. She could sing Harold Arlen and Cole Porter and, and on and on and on. Uh, there, there was really no limit to her versatility. And she had known many, many of the great people, not only in, in classical music, but in show business as well, because she was a very popular television personality for many years. And I think my favorite story about her, <clears throat> if I had to choose one, <laughs> she, she warned me right away when we started working on the book that she, although she remembered the stories and the anecdotes of her life vividly, she wasn't so great on names. And I said, uh, well, that's okay, you know, give me a hint, and I'm sure we can come up with a name. So she said, well, I'm warning you, it's very bad. I have a terrible memory for names. So, uh, in fact, this also turned out to be true, but, you know, it got to be a, a real joke between us. And we always figured out who it was that she was trying to tell the story about. But one day, she stumped me. And... She was talking about what, how one of the, the benefits of being a concert singer was that you got to meet all these interesting people backstage that you might not have met otherwise. And I said, well, give me an example. And she said, well, I remember I was singing with the Philharmonic, and uh, one night, you know who came backstage? Uh, what's her name? <laughs> and I said, oh, can you give me a hint? And she said, oh, you know, uh, honey, you know who I'm talking about. The, the one who wrote the book. <laughs> and I said, well, I, so I Edna Ferber, I don't know. Uh, and uh, she said, no, no, no. Uh, oh, she wrote the famous book that ever, it's so touching. It's such a moving story. And I said, I have no idea who you are talking about. And she finally said, oh, the deaf, dumb, and blind gal. And I, I said, Helen Keller? She said, yeah. And I said, do you know how happy I think Helen Keller would have been to be called a gal? I, I, just, I just think that would have made her life completely. Uh, but that was Eileen. Uh, there was no pretense, no holds barred. And uh, it was one of the greatest relationships I ever had in my life. She, I miss her very much. Uh, the book was finished. Uh, it came out. It did very well for a music book. It got a lot of attention. We we did a, a remember a wonderful event up here at, at Symphony Hall when she received the Leonard. I believe it was the first Leonard Bernstein Award, wasn't? It? Yeah, that's right. From the Longy School of Music, and uh, I can still remember pushing her in her wheelchair and all the stagehands bursting into applause as we came backstage because they'd been there for so many of her her concerts with the BSO and with the Pops. It was, it was just amazing. But uh, I did the book, and I thought, well, I've done a book. Now I'm, I'm through. And my friend Ann Majette told me, no, you'll never be happy until you do another one. So I thought, well, gee, I don't know if I can do another one. And uh, around this time, uh, Opera News was being reformatted. It had been published 17 times a year, which was kind of an odd publication schedule. It came out monthly during the off season and then every other week during uh, the Met broadcast season. And we had wanted for some time to make it a monthly publication, beef it up, redesign it. Um, and we did that in the fall of 1998. And it was very successful, I'm happy to say. Uh, it, it, I continued for uh, a few years after that, full time as executive editor. But it was a lot of work. And I really, really had the growing feeling that what I wanted to do all, uh, more of the time was write. Uh, writing to me is, it's the highlight of my life. I, I can't express it any other way. I love doing it more than I love anything, I think. And uh, uh, so I sat down. And I did something very, very audacious. I wrote a, a new job description. 
that was for the, the position of features editor, and it was a part-time job. It was only half of the time that I was currently putting in at Opera News. And I presented it to my boss, the editor-in-chief, Rue Rauch, who very, very kindly supported me and said, if that's what you want, that's what you've got. I actually just think he wanted to get rid of me, but um, you know, he was very gracious about it. And uh, I became the halftime features editor of, of Opera News, which I still am, I'm happy to say. And I went to work on my second book, which was called The Bennetts and Acting Family. And I am a great lover of the theater and, and of old films as well. And The Bennetts uh, is a biography of the great American stage actor Richard Bennett, who unfortunately is not terribly well remembered anymore, but he, he introduced many of the great American plays of the first part of the century, including Eugene O'Neill's first full-length play, Beyond the Horizon, uh, He Who Gets Slapped, uh, Damaged Goods, which was the first Broadway play to deal with the very controversial subject of venereal disease. He was a very progressive man and a wild man. He was an alcoholic. He was a womanizer. He was uh, famous for giving very fiery curtain speeches at which he railed at the audience for not being more responsive to the play. And I'm sorry to say that Boston audiences were not his favorite. <laughs> he, was, he was very, very tough on the Boston, uh, uh, Boston audiences and the Boston censors at that time. Uh, he became ultimately most famous for his three beautiful daughters, Constance, Barbara, and Joan. And Barbara had a short career, but Constance and Joan, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, were very, very big film stars in the 1930s and 40s. Constance, uh, incredibly, was the highest paid movie star in Hollywood at one time. She was making $30,000 a week in 1931 at the height of the Depression. Uh, and she made such, such films as Common Clay, best remembered probably for Topper with Cary Grant, and Merrily We Live with Brian O'Hearn. Joan Bennett, her, her little sister, was, uh, is remembered for Little Women with Katharine Hepburn, and, and uh, best remembered after she dyed her hair from blonde to brunette and appeared in such uh, film noir classics as The Woman in the Window and Scarlet Street, and then later in the wonderful comedy Father of the Bride with Spencer Tracy. So it was a chance to show uh, an acting family, an acting dynasty, and the progression through many, 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 many years. And it was a tough project because I wasn't writing about one person. I was writing about many, many people. And I nearly lost my mind about a dozen times, I think, while I was working on it, but I finished it. It was published in 2004. And then I was casting around for another project. And uh, this came about in an odd way, and I tell you the story only because if, if there are any writers out there who, who, who are looking for a book contract, you never know how you're going to get one. It's very surprising. I was contacted by Viking, one of the top publishers in New York, about co-authoring Renee Fleming's autobiography. And it wasn't exactly what I, I wanted to do, but I thought, well, you know, go in and talk to them and, and see what they have to say. So uh, in the end, it was narrowed down to two of us. And uh, in the end, she did not work with either one of us. She found another person that she, she preferred, uh, who was a friend of hers, which was fine with me. But uh, Viking called me and said, we liked your proposal so much, and we were hoping she would go with you, that if you have anything else to show us, please do. So I had been thinking for quite a while about doing a book on Ethel Merman. Uh, and it struck me as odd that there wasn't a good, serious biography of her available. She had written her own book. In fact, she had written two of them about 20 years apart. They were, they were written for her. Uh, neither one, I thought, really, really got to the heart of the matter, and neither one, even more important to me, I think, showed the times that she worked and lived through. I wanted to write a book that would really show the progression of the Broadway musical 
And uh, for those of you, again, I just, I'm just curious, how many people here saw Merman on stage? Oh, great. Good, good, good. Uh, well, for those of you who don't know quite so much about her, Ethel Merman was born in Astoria, Queens, in, <laughs> in 1908. And uh, her centennial is coming up on January 16th. And she was an only child. She was born into a, a working class family. Uh, two parents who adored her, loved her, supported her, gave her unconditional support and, and belief. And she exhibited quite a remarkable singing voice from an early age. She got nothing but encouragement at home. And by the time she had graduated from high school, she was singing in clubs and restaurants around New York. And in 1930, she was singing at the Brooklyn Paramount Theater. And these were the days when uh, there was live entertainment between the movie showings at, at all the big theaters that the studio chain zoned. And she was singing, and a producer named Vinton Friedley, a Broadway producer, came to see her because he'd heard how good she was. And indeed, she was good. And he brought her to the attention of George and Ira Gershwin, who were writing the score for the show that Friedley was about to produce called Girl Crazy. So Ethel was taken to the, uh, George Gershwin's apartment, and she was quite nervous. And he sat down and played the three songs that she would eventually sing in the show, and those were Sam and Delilah, uh, Boy, What Love Has Done For Me, and the song that became one of her most famous signature tunes, I Got Rhythm. And he finished and sat back and said, well, Miss Merman, if there's anything you don't like about any of these songs, I'll be more than happy to change them. <laughs> and she was absolutely astonished by this. She, she told the story for years and years and years. She never got over the, the, the surprise of that, that this great, great man would, would be willing to do it. Uh, so she said, no, no, I think they're just fine. <laughs> and uh, she did sing, sing all of them in the show. And on opening night, when she sang I Got Rhythm, she stopped the show cold. Uh, shows don't stop anymore, I don't think, so much the way they used to. I mean, it, it used to be that they, they were stopped cold, and you might even get an encore if a number was, was going over well enough with the audience. Uh, this one certainly did. Dorothy Fields, a great songwriter, said she never heard an ovation like it in her life. She said the only one comparable was Mary Martin on opening night of Leave It to Me, singing My Heart Belongs to Daddy. The audience was absolutely in pandemonium. And she was a star overnight. She was a star, and she remained a star for many, many years, right up until she died in 1984. Uh, she went from, uh, Ethel Merman really has the distinction, I think, of being the only Broadway star who never appeared in a flop. It just didn't happen. I mean, some runs were shorter than others, but she had a remarkable run. She did five Cole Porter shows, starting with Anything Goes, going through Red Hot and Blue, and uh, uh, Dewberry Was a Lady, Panama Hattie, Something for the Boys. She did two classic Irving Berlin shows, Annie Get Your Gun, which she played on Broadway for three years and hardly missed a performance, and Call Me Madam, which she played for two years. She did Gypsy, which was really the crowning achievement of her career. She played the domineering stage mother, Rose, who is pushing both her daughters on the stage. And I, I don't know, I don't think there's any better musical anywhere than Gypsy. I, I think it's, it, it's just a, an amazing dramatic piece. And it certainly gave her a role of greater dramatic scope than she had ever been offered before. And she knew it. She knew what a great opportunity she had been given. Uh, for those of you who might not know Gypsy, there's a a, a remarkable scene at the end of the show. It's called, there's a number called Rose's Turn, in which Rose, this pushy, overbearing mother, finally has, has alienated not one, but both of her daughters. And she has essentially a musical nervous breakdown on stage. It's almost like an operatic aria. And 
she uh, this this remarkable piece was written for her by Julie Stein and Stephen Sondheim, who wrote the entire score. And it's a very, very dramatic, maybe the most intensely dramatic scene in all uh, a Broadway musical history. And there's a famous story about it when Stephen Sondheim was explaining how the scene was to go to her. He said, now, Ethel, uh, there, there's a moment in the number in which you're going to be asked to stammer on a line. And the line, I'm sure many of you know it, is m -m 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 mama, m -m mama. And Ethel said, well, what does that mean? I don't know why. And he said, well, it's, it's, a, it's a nervous breakdown I'm trying to show. I, he said, I got the idea years ago when I went uh, to see Jessica Tandy on Broadway play Blanche Dubois in A Streetcar Named Desire. I, I want to show the complete mental disintegration of this woman, Rose, in musical terms. <laughs> And Ethel listened, and she nodded, and she said, uh, okay, uh, there's this one thing I want to know. Does it come on the upbeat or the downbeat? <laughs> uh, Ethel Merman and Stephen Sondheim were not cut out to be good friends. Uh, he was a very intellectual artist. She was not an intellectual performer by, or, or, or an intellectual woman by any stretch of the imagination. And... Unfortunately, I think both Sondheim and Arthur Lawrence, who wrote the book of the show, have said a number of very, very disparaging things about her over the years, and they should stop, because she, it's a great show. They don't need to do that, but she made it happen on stage in a way that nobody else who's played that part ever has. And uh, her conductor, Eric Knight, told me the thing about Merman was every time she came out, she delivered. Every time. Uh, so, Gypsy, greatest success of her career. The greatest disappointment of her career was that she did not get to repeat the role in the 1962 Warner Brothers film version that went to Rosalind Russell. And Ethel would go to parties and say, well, that broad can't even sing. Why, why did they give her the part? You know, uh, But uh, she then concentrated primarily on film and, and television appearances. In 1970, she did her final Broadway show, Hello, Dolly, which actually had been written for her by Jerry Herman. And David Merrick, who had produced Gypsy, was, was going to produce Hello, Dolly, and they were confident that she would accept it. And Jerry Herman told me about the day that David Merrick made the phone call, and Ethel turned him down flat. She said, I've done too many long runs. I'm tired. I can't do another one. I want to do, I want to do television and movies. And so, of course, the, part, the, the show was reconfigured and, and given to Carol Channing. However... There were two numbers in the show that Jerry Herman had written for Ethel that vocally Carol Channing just couldn't handle. And they were never done. In the, in the long parade of ladies who did Dolly on Broadway, Betty Grable, Martha Ray, Ginger Rogers, on and on and on, Pearl Bailey, the songs remained in the trunk. So, in 1970, Merrick called Ethel and said, I want to make this the longest running musical in Broadway history. I want to make it uh, longer than My Fair Lady. I want to beat the record. And if you come in and take over the part, I think we can do it. Uh, at the moment, Phyllis Diller was playing the role, <laughs> incredibly enough. And uh, it was playing to half empty houses. So Ethel said, uh, OK, I'll do it for three months. But I want, to do the, I want to do those two songs that were written initially. So she did. And the odd thing about that was that they didn't cut anything else from the show. They just added these two numbers to it. Uh, and it was quite a workout for a, a woman who was getting on in years at that point. But she did indeed make it the longest running show at, up to that time in Broadway history, musical show. And uh, she played it for nine months and then closed it. And that was it for Ethel on Broadway, really. Uh, the rest of her career was, was uh, consumed with television appearances, a couple of, of memorable cameos in, in movies. I'm sure a lot of you have seen her famous cameo in the movie Airplane, where she plays the, uh, the 
war veteran in the in the uh, mental ward who thinks he's Ethel Merman and and has to be sedated. Um, but she also got great pleasure out of doing symphonic concerts, and the first big one that she did was in 1975 right here in Boston with the Boston Pops. I remember as a kid in Oregon watching it on television, and she did the famous medley that Roger, of, her, of her, her big hit songs that Roger Edens had devised for her in the 1950s, and she was in great shape vocally, and she knocked him dead again, and this led to a long series of, uh, of uh, symphonic appearances with, with orchestras all over the world, <clears throat> and that was really her bread and butter until she died. Personally, Ethel was not as well liked by many people as she was by the people who worked with her. It was interesting. When I was writing this book, I interviewed almost 130 people, and I went back to, I found people dating back to Duberry was a lady in 1939, believe it or not. And very, I don't think anyone, I literally don't think anyone really had anything terribly negative to say about the experience of working with her. Uh, but her agents, in particular, did not like working with her. I think she was very tough on them, and they had plenty to say about how tough and intractable she really could be. Um, I think that there's a direct connection between this, this little girl who grew up adored by her parents and had this totally outward-directed personality and not really any introspective ability at all that I could find. She was not a great reader. She was not a great thinker. She was, uh, she was a very simple person in many, many ways. I think there's a very direct connection between that and her very out there performing style. She was not somebody like Judy Garland who internalized the songs. She sort of threw them out at the audience. Uh, a rare exception to that, I think we saw tonight, the, uh, that old feeling, which is absolutely one of the most devastating performances I have ever heard her give. And that clip was actually the thing that made me want to write this book. It was, it was so overpowering. Um, but in general, she did, she did not internalize. Uh, she, she threw it out at the audience. Uh, she also had a funny habit, <clears throat> which a few people did complain about, of not looking at her fellow actors on stage. And I think that this stemmed from the fact that she had appeared early in her career with many vaudevillians. And in vaudeville, of course, what you did was just, here I am, and out to the audience. Uh, she was not exactly what you would call an ensemble player. She, she would plant herself in the middle of the stage and, and, and send it out to you. And of course, her, her voice was so remarkable that she could be heard all the way at the back of the house. I think the great composers loved her not only for her remarkable voice, but even more for the fact that her diction was so incredible. And that's really what the Gershwins, Cole Porter, and Irving Berlin were after. I think it's the same reason they liked Fred Astaire. He wasn't really much of a singer. But the words are crystal clear, and so were Ethel's. And as wonderful as all those melodies are, I think it's the words we hang on to, don't you think? I mean, in, in so many cases, certainly in the case of Cole Porter, I think it's the words that, that, that really stay with us. Uh, and Ethel was incomparable at getting those words across. Uh, she had a rather unhappy personal life, in fact, a very unhappy personal life. She had four failed marriages, two children, one of whom, as I mentioned earlier, died when she was quite young, in her mid-twenties, and um, a, a somewhat up-and-down relationship with her son, which, while it ended happily, had its, had its rough spots. And unfortunately, I, I think... And I try to show this in the book without banging you over the head with it. I think there was a, a funny kind of emptiness in her. I think there was something that wasn't fully formed in her. Uh, as, as thrilling as she was on stage, I think at times in the performances you can even see it in the, in, in, in the singing. 
uh, or hear it in the singing. Uh, but this, she had a very, very sharp black and white view of the world. And you were either with her or you were against her. And that was all there was to it. Uh, there was not much gray area at all. And she had a, a wonderful expression. She had a very strong code of ethics. And if you had violated that, if, you felt, uh, if she felt you had used her in any way, if she felt that you had uh, violated her trust or lied to her, she had an expression. She would say, thing. And that meant you were out of her life. Thing. So feel free to use it if you like. It's F-I-N-G exclamation point. Um, but uh, it, it certainly did not hold her in good stead in her personal life uh, at all, unfortunately. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, uh, this book has been just a, a remarkable project in my life. It's, it's been a... Uh, it's been my favorite thing I've ever worked on, I have to say. It was, it was just a privilege to, to do the research, to meet all the people who worked with her, and to try to make the life of, of the woman that I still think is the greatest star in the history of the Broadway musical come alive for the reader. And I, I just wanted to read you a brief section, if that's okay, which will <clears throat> illustrate a little bit of what I just explained to you. Um, it also tells you a lot about her sense of humor and her lack of pretense and her incredible honesty. And I'm going to start, this is toward the end of the book. Uh, in the late 1970s, Ethel was kind of getting tired of what was happening to the Broadway musical. She didn't understand the musicals of Stephen Sondheim or, or later on Andrew Lloyd Webber. She didn't quite understand the appeal of them and she was feeling a little alienated. So that's where I'm going to start. Deep down, Ethel was beginning to have a gnawing feeling that Broadway had begun to forget about her or at the very least to have taken her for granted. The year 1980 marked her 50th anniversary in the theater and few in the Broadway community seemed to notice or care. One who did was her friend, stage manager Bob Shear, who took it upon himself, without telling her, to try to have a Broadway theater renamed for her. He went first to the owners of the Alvin, where he was turned down flat. He also met with rejections from the owners of the Imperial, the St. James, and nearly every other theater in town. Finally, he tried the owners of the Apollo, which had recently been remodeled, the owners were enthusiastic about the idea, and it seemed sentimentally fitting. The Apollo was the theater where Ethel had performed both George White's scandals and Take a Chance. With the deal all but signed, Bob went to see Ethel to tell her the good news he thought was certain to please her. Ethel was incensed. The idea flopped with her on every conceivable level. For one thing, she hated surprises of any kind. For another, the idea that someone would try to drum up support for her without her knowledge as if she were a charity case infuriated her. Finally, the fact that it would be the Apollo and not one of the more prestigious theaters that would be named after her was an insult. Did I ever ask you to do anything about naming a theater after me? She railed at Bob. Who the hell gave you permission to do that? And the Apollo? What does that have to do with me? Do you think that theater is going to be there in 20 years? Mark my words. It isn't going to be there. As it happened, she was right. The Apollo closed a few years later. Shear wrote her, attempting to assuage her anger. In response, Ethel wrote him a letter typed on her own electric typewriter. Dear Bob, thank you for your letter of September 28th. I appreciate you having my interests at heart, and I think part of the success that I have been fortunate enough to have has been because I have had such nice friends. All good wishes, Ethel. She open copied the letter to her financial advisor, Irving Katz, and did not speak to Shear again for nearly a year. In the fall of 1980, Ethel was on hand at the New York State Theater for an all-star gala honoring Beverly Sills at her final operatic performance. 
The opera was New York City Opera's production of Deflator Mouse, and in the famous Act Two party scene, a collection of Sills' show business friends and colleagues each did a special turn. Before this, however, the audience had to endure the first part of Flater Mouse's Act II, which I must say I, is tough for me as an opera critic, um, which was given an extremely arch and unfunny performance with Kitty Carlisle in the trouser role of Prince Orlovsky. In the dressing room that she shared with Mary Martin and Eileen Farrell, Ethel sat with her hands folded across her stomach and her feet propped up, staring at the television monitor as the act dragged on. Finally, she pronounced the entire performance, shit, and asked Farrell how long it was going to last. Things didn't get much better once the stars began parading across the stage, as there were too many opera stars offering up painfully labored versions of pop songs, notably Leontine Price's What I Did for Love. Walking off with the whole show were Mary Martin with a stunning rendition of My Heart Belongs to Daddy and Ethel with There's No Business Like Show Business. At the party afterward, <clears throat> Ethel admitted to a reporter that she had never actually seen one of Sills's operas. But her, enthusiasm, her enthusiasm for the art form, which had, had been running for several years, continued. Her current favorite was the magnetic American baritone Cheryl Milnes, whom she had heard in his Met performances of Rigoletto and Macbeth, and she had started to pick up some of the terminology associated with opera singers. After one of her concerts, she jokingly asked her agent, Bob Gardner, what was better tonight, my head voice or my chest voice? In the early, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump. Uh, although Ethel was anything but a constant theater goer, she dutifully went to see her close friends perform. It didn't matter whether the venue was Broadway, the Straw Hat Circuit, or a nightclub. When Carol Cook's husband, Tom Troop, starred in Same Time Next Year at the Westbury Music Fair, Ethel trekked out to Long Island twice to see the show. She showed up for all of Tony Quantro's nightclub engagements, often bringing an entire table of friends with her and always picking up the check at the end of the night. Occasionally, she could be spotted at a Broadway opening night. Some shows, however, inspired indifference or outrage in her. When Andrew Lloyd Webber's Cats was opening on Broadway in 1982, she received an invitation to a cocktail party that Josh and Netta Logan were hosting for Webber. She sent it along in the mail to Tony Quantro, scribbling on the card, Wanna go? Then, having circled Weber's name, she wrote, Who the hell is he? When John Kander and Fred Ebb's Woman of the Year reached Broadway in 1981, Ethel was in the first night audience. Her opinion of Lauren Bacall's musical abilities had not changed since applause 11 years earlier. As Bacall barked out her first few lines, Ethel, seated in the third row of the orchestra on the aisle, bellowed, Jesus! <laughs> Was anybody there? <laughs> People on stage heard it, said the show's conductor, Donald Pippen. I certainly heard it. At intermission, Ethel came breezing into Bacall's dressing room despite the doorman's attempts to prevent her from entering. As a dazed Bacall looked on helplessly, Ethel said, Honey, I have to have a drink, and went to the bar to fix herself one. After she tossed it back, she said, Oh, that's just what I needed. Okay, see you on stage, second act, and barreled out of the room without saying one word about the performance. According to Donald Pippen, Bacall was for the first time in her career, speechless. Um, so that's a little sampling of the book. Uh, it's, it's very exciting what, what has happened to this book. The response has been amazing. And uh, I think it's a wonderful thing when you write. Uh, I just, as I said, I love writing more than anything. But you never know what's going to happen. And with this book, everything has just gone right from the word go. And I'm a very, very happy, very, very grateful author. And I'm very, very proud to be a writer. And thank you so much for having me here to speak to you tonight.
Thank you. Now, do we have any questions about Ethel or the Bennetts or Eileen Farrell or anything else? What am I going to write next? Uh, I, I'm not sure I'm supposed to say what the very next thing is. Uh, I can tell you that down the road, <clears throat> probably for her centennial, is going to be a biography of Mary Martin. So um, I didn't want to do it right after this because I just thought it seemed like too much of a bookend. But uh, that will be happening eventually. But the next one is, uh, is a secret at the moment. Uh, I'm also working on a novel at, uh, about my experiences growing up in Oregon, so please say a prayer for me on that one. <laughs> yes? The two songs that Ethel added to Hello Dolly were World Take Me Back and Love Look in My Window. And they're good songs. Uh, the funny thing about them is that they kind of cover exactly the same ground that Before the Parade Passes By does. It, the, the, it's the same idea exactly. You know, she's coming back. She's re-entering the mainstream. And, uh, but audiences didn't mind. <laughs> they just wanted more of her. Yes? A weekend marriage. Uh, oh, 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 yes, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, she did. Her, her, uh, he asked if we, she had a weekend marriage. Ethel's fourth and final marriage was to the actor Ernest Borgnine, and it lasted for just one month. It was the shortest, one of the shortest marriages on record. Uh, I just read in Publishers Weekly that he's doing his own book, so I guess we're going to get his side of the story, too, which should be interesting. Um, it was a, a, a terrible match. She thought at first it was going to be the great romance of her life. <clears throat> he sort of wined her and dined her and wooed her, and he was you know, substantially younger than she was, and he had a big hit television series, and he'd won an Academy Award, and, and he seemed like a great catch. And uh, uh, he wasn't. He, he had a rather troubling marital history before and after Ethel. Uh, I don't think, you know, not in his last wife. I think that's been very happy. But uh, they did not get along, <laughs> to put it mildly. And they went on a honeymoon to the Far East, and they came back on the following day. It was, it was, it was, it was all over, all over. So, <laughs> anyway, yes. I'm wondering if your mom is still living in, if so, what she thinks of your writing this book. Oh, she, <laughs> my mother is still living. Thank you for asking. Uh, she is going to be 90 in March. And uh, she's very, very happy that it's been a success. And, but she said, but I want you to know, I still don't like her. <laughs> if I wrote a book about Margaret Whiting or Joe Stafford, I think she'd be much happier. So. Yes. Yeah. I didn't, uh, the question was, is Ethel Merman's son still living? And if so, did I interview him? He is. He lives in the Bay Area and just north of the city. Uh, and he's a very private man, uh, somewhat reclusive even. He lives in a, a little community called uh, Bolinas. And uh, it's, it's frequented by people who kind of want to get away from it all. And he was very nice and, and very, uh, he didn't in any way stand in my way, but he told me I, I don't cooperate with biographers as a rule and I, I, I'll just sit this one out. However, I did get a very nice phone call from him right around the time the book came out. And he said, uh, I, I wish I had. I, I've been told by several people who you did speak with that I should have. And uh, he said, I, I regret it. So that was nice, I think. But he's, he, he did not in any way impede me. So Her, uh, his, uh, his niece, Ethel's granddaughter, Barbara Geary, gave me her full cooperation. So there's a lot from her in the book. And as I said, from almost 130 of her friends and, and co-workers. Anybody? Yeah. We, di we didn't see oh. any, cl any clips of the, of the of Farrell or the, or, uh, 
the the uh, the Bennetts. No, uh, would no, you like to see? <laughs> we saw. We know. We know that you're selling this book now, and we love these clips. Sure. We saw Ethel Merman on the stage. I think it was 1949. Uh huh. We had gone to a dinner. And we afterwards, we sat in the first row of the first balcony, and we got splitting headaches. <laughs> but we love her. <laughs> Were you dating my mother by any chance at the time? I no, we liked your mother, too. <laughs> well, I'm sorry I didn't have any clips of the others, but you can go to the video store and get the Bennetts. <laughs> yes. To compare, I'm just curious if you were to compare how you feel about the large musical theater personality of Ethel Merman compared to the large operatic personality of Eileen Farrell, and what you think is similar about them and or different because they come from such different worlds, but in some ways are so similar in their largesse. Yeah. Oh, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I I would answer that by saying that I think they were both very, very solid people, uh, sure of themselves, sure of their talent. Uh, Eileen, too, had a lot of confidence, had a mother who really, really gave her a lot of, of self-confidence and support. And like Ethel, Eileen didn't really f ever have any failures. You know, she, she came to CBS <clears throat> radio as a chorister in, 1930, in 1940. And after just a few months in the chorus, they said, well, you're too loud. Um, so we're going to give you your own radio show. And so it, there was a similar lack of struggle, I think, with both of them, you know. And uh, I think that that was kind of one of the defining things of their lives. Thank you I'm for doing this. Uh, Ethel, Merman was, Ethel Merman was different. She sounded different, mm -hmm. she looked different, and her persona was different. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people didn't like her yeah. because she was different. Right. America has become so homogenized. If you don't look like everybody else, you don't sound like everybody else, you're not well accepted. Well, she was one of my most favorite people because her voice was so different from anybody else. You got a wonderful review in the New York Times. And thank you for doing a biography. Well, thank you very much. That's very nice. She was different. You're right. And that was actually one of the part of the impetus for starting the book. I thought, isn't this amazing that this woman, I mean, she was not a beautiful woman. It was not a voice for all tastes by any quest, but that she became the queen of Broadway. It was a different time. I think it was. It was an age of personalities that we don't have anymore, I think. Yes. What is your opinion of Broadway today? The Broadway musical? I don't like a lot of what I, I see. I just don't. Uh, I don't. I don't like the Lloyd Webber shows. I think maybe those are kind of behind us now. Um, I think that has crested. Uh, uh, Oh, I just, I've just been told he's writing Phantom, too, so there goes that theory. <laughs> um, uh, I was a great lover uh, of Sondheim. I've always been. I think he's a fascinating musician. But uh, I don't like a lot of what I see. For one thing, I don't like this gross amplification where you cannot tell who is singing on the stage. You cannot tell where the sound is coming from. And I, I've been to shows where I just, it was an assault. On, on my hearing, on my brain. Uh, however, I do have to say, I, in the past couple of years, I've seen two things that were absolutely remarkable. One was Adam Gettle's The Light in the Piazza. One of the finest things I ever saw. Fresh, original, beautiful. And the other, which a lot of people did not like, was uh, Grey Gardens. Uh, which had one of the most amazing performances I've ever seen by Christine Ebersole, and, and another one by Mary Louise Wilson. And so I think there's a lot of good work being done, but whether or not it makes it to Broadway, you know, is another question. So. Yes.
Broadway. I was just at the Metropolitan Opera about three weeks ago, <clears throat> and I went to see uh, the Magic Flute. And at one time, I had sung the Queen of the Night. I had studied with Roberta Peters' teacher with William Herman, and I was right. so thrilled to go back and see the Die Zauberflöte. But I have to tell you, I was appalled at the staging, at the grandiose uh, effects, sound effects, and technicalities. And I love Mozart. And I thought, why does the Met need to do this? And someone turned to me and she was German. She said, well, I think they are trying to make a Broadway production out of it. I was <laughs> appalled because the singing was not what I heard with Lisa Della Casa and all those wonderful singers and Cesare Valletti and all of them. Mm -hmm. And it, would it seemed to me it was just out of, out of proportion. The second thing that I wanted to tell you about was Eileen Farrell. I loved her and the first time I met her is when I was a young student at the conservatory in Cincinnati. And she had come to Cincinnati to do the big bicentennial, which was a, a large um, um, concert that they, they do every year. And um, I was chosen to sing with her in one of the, the uh, Wagnerian um, repertoire that she was doing. And I was just absolutely, um, how can I say, I was mesmerized by her, but I was rather shy and scared to death. Mm -hmm. And she was so wonderful. She just said, my dear, sing. Do you love to sing? And I said, yes, Miss Farrell, I do. And shortly afterwards, there, was, there were a, a bit of people in what they call the gold room going up to her. And this young student, who was a colleague of mine from the conservator, said, Miss Farrell, now tell me, what, how do you place your soft palate? And he was going through all the anatomical things. And this is her, her, her humor that I saw full force. And she said, hell, boy, I just open my mouth and sing. What do you do? And now I would like to have a Coca-Cola. <laughs> I just had to share that. That's she my girl. So, she was wonderful. And her jazz, I went to hear her sing jazz one uh, evening um, in New York at one of the clubs. And she sang, and Satchmo was there, all of those people. You would never have known that two days before, you know, she had sung a Wagnerian opera. Right. And here she is. She did not sing. Um, Tiri Kiri Tekanawa has tried to sing jazz, and she sounds like Kiri Tekanawa, the opera star, but Farrell did not. When she was in no. the other idiom, she no, was she completely didn't. She, divorced she, she from really, it. It, was, it was an entirely different uh, thing. Uh, it's, it's funny, I, oh, another of my favorite stories about Eileen uh, was told to me by a, someone who was a student of hers at uh, Indiana University, where she taught for many years in the 1970s. And uh, Eileen, like Ethel, didn't like to talk about how she did it vocally. Ethel, when somebody asked Ethel how she breathed, she said, necessity. <laughs> and Eileen was, it was very much the same way. Uh, she, this, this student that she had one day wanted to engage her in a very, very complex discussion about vocal technique and the, or the placement and the hard palate and the soft palate. And this, and, Eileen let her go for a while, and then one day she said, Honey, i got to be honest with you. I don't know your soft palate from a hole in the ground. <laughs> so that was, that was the way that went. Um, yes, he uh, uh, was Merman's son in the theater is the question. He began in the theater. Bobby began in the theater uh, backstage. He was uh, interested in directing. He was interested. He was a stage manager for a number of years. He worked on the technical side of things, and he taught acting for a while at the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco. Uh, but uh, he hasn't been in it for quite some time. No, I wouldn't. I, I think that is a cheat. I think I did the book. I mean, I, w I would expand certain things that are in the book already. But um, I will s if you read, if any of you read the New York Times Sunday Book Review carefully, the participation of, of Ethel's son uh, in a competing book that came out at the same time was mentioned and not at all favorably. And 
Uh, I've been very lucky. Uh, Eileen Farrell's children in no way tried to impose their vision of anything on me, and I, I had the cooperation of all the Bennett, uh, the next generation of Bennetts, and they neither did they. Um, I wouldn't want, I think, to get into this particular. Yeah, I, I, it's it's my book. It's I've done it the way I envisioned it, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Anyone else? Thank you, Mr. Cole. Well, I think we have time for one more. Uh, you've already been. <laughs> so, was there someone over here? Yeah. You mentioned at one point in her career she was making $30,000 a week, which at the time was a phenomenal amount of money. Constance money. Bennett. I was wondering what type of person she was with her f finances. Constance Bennett. Excuse me? Constance Bennett, you mean? Yes. Constance Bennett was, was making $30,000 a year, uh, about $30,000 a week uh, for a period in the 1930s. Uh, what kind of person was she with her finances? She was terrible with her finances. She spent every dime she made, and, and her entire life was really a struggle to keep up financially. Uh, she made a lot of bad investments. Uh, she wasn't a very good money manager, unfortunately. Uh, she told a reporter once that she, uh, who was asking her about this, that it, asking her if she had spent her entire fortune, as was rumored, and she said, well, I couldn't spend that kind of money if I used ermine for toilet paper. But, in fact, she did. <laughs> she, she went through it all. Anyway, if you have any further questions, I'm going to be signing books, and I'll be happy to answer them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But thank you again very much.